All right, we are rolling. Welcome to another episode of Fit Pet Boston Talks, where I sit down and I talk with local Boston, Massachusetts area dog handling professionals, and we chit chat about our lives, our dogs, and our careers. But instead of doing that today, Laurie and I are going to talk a little bit about advocating for your dog and how as dog owners and dog lovers, we can be better advocates for our dogs in different situations. And this series is going to be broken up a little bit. So today we are going to talk about advocating um, for your dog with friends and family. And then down the road, we're going to do at least one, if not two more episodes about advocating for your dog with strangers and advocating for your dog with other dogs. So it's kind of a big topic and we just wanted to break it up a little bit. And I just wanted to take a second and realize that this, um, you know, this is definitely a little bit more dog training and advice heavy information than, you know, what we normally do on the show. But I think that it's a great message for our clients to hear. And it's a great message for people to hear that might be looking at us from afar and wanting to know a little bit more about us as trainers before recommending our services. Whether you are a a dog owner or you own another dog business and, you know, want to know a little bit more about what we do here uh, in the area that we work in. So, Once again, today we're going to talk about advocating for your dog, but first I wanted to take a second and thank our sponsor, Crate Escape 2. Um, I just wanted to let you guys know really quick once I find out exactly what it is that I need to say. All right. Located in Cambridge, Massachusetts, Crate Escape 2 offers dog daycare for smaller dogs, and this facility has an awesome store, which is stocked with incredible items. High-quality leashes, lines, leads, harnesses, and collars, locally sourced high-value treats, and an assortment of dry and raw dog food. Dog beds and dog toys. I could go on. If you've ever done a class with ABC Dog Training, you know all of the items you need for training can't be found in one place anywhere besides online merchandisers. But I'm here to tell you that if you're local, please check out Crate Escape 2. If you're a trainer or a walker, you'll also love it. Use code FITPET15 for 15% off merchandise at checkout. Once again, FITPET15 to save 15% on gear at Crate Escape 2 in Cambridge, Massachusetts. So I wanted to talk about advocating for your dog today because one of the things that we often give advice about when we meet a client for the first time that just acquired a dog, whether it's a puppy or a grown dog, um, are questions about what to do with a dog when friends and family come over or what to do if, you know, one of their friends and family members wants to handle the dog or wants to give the dog a treat or wants to train the dog or does is afraid of dogs. And it kind of brought about um, the topic of just in general advocating for your dog on a micro level. So we're talking about, you know, your specific dog and you're not talking about, you know, marching on the state house for you know, leash laws or spay and neuter rules or whatever. Um, This is a micro level. So advocating for your dog in your relationship. So I was hoping uh, in the beginning here, if you just kind of wanted to talk a little bit, Laurie, about, you know, some of the things that we tell people when they ask us questions in those beginning classes, when they're just trying to figure out, you know, what it means to have this new being in their household. Hello. Well, sometimes people, they'll come in for a class and it's just that every, because I always talk about when your dog is with your family, of course, you're you're training them. But when guests come over, I feel like parents get frazzled and the dog is out of the crate and they just let the dog, they kind of just let the dog go. And then that leads to a bunch of behavioral issues. If your dog is, so all the company's like, no, 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 all your your family and your friends or whoever is entering your door, they're, they just say, no, let the dog go. I'll pet him. I'll touch him. I don't care if he jumps or nips at me. It's fine. It's fine. And so I think that in that case, I always tell people, no, have your dog on a leash and then work the behavior and and tell your friends and family that you want your dog to be really well behaved and that you just need to take a moment to gather yourself and put a leash on your puppy and start training them in those situations. A lot of the times too, people have the uncle or the grandfather and I don't mean to stereotype, but usually guys are the ones who want a rough house with the dog. And no matter what the temperament of the dog, that's probably not a good idea because it'll lead to nipping, biting, or just your, if your dog is a, a little shy or a little nervous it, and people start to come on strong, it's a really bad 
first experience. So you want to make sure that every experience is suited to your dog. So it's okay to tell your family to stay away and just wait a minute while you train them or keep them in the tra- the crate, the treat, treat, crate, um, keep them in the crate until you can take them out and start to work them. And if your family isn't paying attention to you or respecting your wishes and they're still wrestling with the dog or really scruffing the dog's face up, which can get a lot of dogs going and make them a little bit crazy. Just bring them over to the crate if your family's not listening to you. You should do the same thing if your kids do it. If your kid's trying to put a tutu on the dog and you know that the dog hates it, then put the dog away. Right. Save yeah. the dog. Help your dog. Don't just let him have at it because if he's a nervous dog or a shaky temperament, he's not going to get over it. He'll just hate it. Yeah, I was thinking specifically, I think, with the quarantine situation that we have, some dogs, I'm finding a few examples, obviously our sample size isn't humongous, but a few examples of dogs that really, you know, grow from puppies into adolescence, and they're just being handled too much by members of the family, and then it kind of turns into the dog, like, not wanting that to happen anymore when they're, you know kind of need to be able to be by themselves they don't need to be picked up or on the couch and stuff like that then they start nipping to tell the people to go away right right that's the exact example that i'm thinking of yeah that are a few i think that are happening recently yeah it depends on the temperament of the dog i had another dog who a family adopted a 10 year old deaf dog and he's sweet as pie but he's 10 years old and at that age dogs usually like to be left alone And the existing dog that they have in the house, she's a sweetheart and you can do anything to her and she's bulletproof. But this fella just came out of Puerto Rico and he loves his new home and he loves his mom, but he doesn't like to be touched and pet all the time. And the young girls in the house are so used to being able to do that to their current dog. And, you know, the mother texted me kind of worried because the old dog snapped at her daughter and... You know, he did it once and then the following day he did it again, but it was all circumstances where the daughter just was not leaving the dog alone. And she was certainly old enough to know the difference. And the mother was awesome because she goes, you know, Laurie, I saw, I I said, let's not make a huge situation out of this. He's an older dog. He's deaf. He, you have to be very careful with deaf dogs. Make sure you let them know that you're coming. Whether that means, you know, sometimes I'll just like tap the floor to let them know, or I just go around where they can see me. And the young girl was just, she, she's like, the mother said, Laurie, you know, you're right. You know, I could see that the dog was getting uncomfortable. I was telling my daughter just what you're telling me now. And I said, don't sneak up on the dog. He doesn't need to be touched all the time. And a lot of the time, that's why I'll, that I'll tell people, put a leash on your dog so that you're not always grabbing them and touching them. That's one of the other reasons I say to put a leash on. It's so It's because... Sometimes we're just nice, friendly, and we're always touching the dog, but other times we're trying to stop the dog from going someplace and we end up grabbing them. Not, And it might not even be rough, but you're being quick when you, when you grab them from behind. If you're able to take the leash, it's a lot less hands-on and your hands don't become so offensive. Because imagine how you would feel if you were headed in the direction to do something and somebody kept grabbing you from behind. Right. So... Right, completely. Yeah, I was thinking about the example. I'll use my sister, for example. Um, I brought Ruben over to her place a couple months ago, and we were sitting out um, on the porch, and I have Ruben next to me because, in general, Ruben's super nervous just being anywhere outside the house. Um, He's not bad. He listens. He's very obedient, but his mindset is not good. He's just uncomfortable. And so he is comfortable when he's laying next to me. So I had him laying next to me and my brother-in-law came in and, you know, he asked, can I pet Ruben? I said, sure. So he Ruben got off the bed. My brother-in-law was petting him. It was really nice. And my nephew, who is not even two, but is a fairly large child for his age, and he's sweet as pie. He's a linebacker. He, yeah, he's sweet as pie. But he just went right up to Ruben and like roundhoused him right in the head <laughs> for no reason because he's can't understand what is going he's on. Two. He's two. And, you know, I mean, Ruben came right to me. I mean, it was, I think it was more stunning than anything else. But, um, 
But basically in that situation, what I learned was, okay, I, I cannot bring my dog into this house until my nephew is old enough to understand, you know, to leave the dog alone. And that's okay. It's not bad parenting for my sister. It's just that both of those creatures need to be so heavily managed that the two of us talking aren't, is going to be difficult. And, you know, in, in that situation, you know, I think the personality of Ruben and the personality of Wes, like, goes into it. But, you know, as, as for me, I'm as a dog owner, I have to make sure that, you know, my dog's safe and he, you know, has a full set of teeth that I don't want him to ever have to use. So I need to make sure that it's not, I'm not putting him in an overly challenging situation, um, with a toddler who doesn't know any better. So, you know, and I, I was also stimulated to think about this because online on Twitter, I saw somebody that I pretty highly respect in the cycle cycling community, a bike racer, ask for advice on Twitter about um, the very topic that we're talking about. Um, and, you know, how a lot of the people responded, you have to separate. So you just have to separate until they're, but then there'd be like a few comments littered in there that were like, you know, a little bit more lenient. But I was just thinking about that as a, as an example you know, a young child that's just learning to walk or whatnot and a dog, it's just really, really difficult. And so, you know, kind of separating and managing the behavior with space and a crate and things of that nature are just super, super important. Um, I was also thinking about um, petting and you use the example a lot, Laurie, when you, um, you know, with the food, like to the nose, do you want to talk about that? Anytime I... Anytime I have a young puppy, I always tell people to keep their expectations low at first when they're when they're greeting somebody. So normally, what people will do is run up to the puppy and start yelling "sit." And if they're if the owner isn't yelling "sit," the guests are yelling "sit" at the dog. So one is if you have your dog on a leash, you're already kind of taking charge and you're working with the dog so closely and you're interacting with them that the other person tends to just shut up and let you work with the dog. And I said, keep your expectations low. Well, maybe like, cause everyone wants the dog to sit and stay and it's a 10 week old puppy. So that's unrealistic to me. Right. So I say, all I care is that all four paws are on the ground and they're not eating the person that's saying hi to them. So I usually get down on the dog's level, maybe on one knee, and I have a handful of food. I'm actually cupping my hand with fake food right now, but you all can't see that. <laughs> um, so I, I have a treat in my hand. I'm just holding it while the dog chews it. And then I say to the person, okay, pet the dog. And then that's how the dog greets people. So yeah. it, it helps. And then it's a good interaction. And then before the people get crazy and stupid and start talking in puppy language and, ah, and get too excited, I say, oh, thank you for petting the dog. And then I walk away. And I do that with my family members too. And if I think somebody is too rough petting my dog, I have no problem saying, stop it. And then if they don't stop, I just walk away with yeah, my and, dog. And that was really another important point that I wanted to make. It is, you know, I think the thing is, is sometimes people's personalities don't less necessarily line up for with advocating for your dog, you know, and for me included, you know, it's, it's not easy for me to tell my own dad, like, dad, come on, stop petting Ruben so much over his head. He doesn't like it. You know, it's, I, you know, and I almost have to kind of phrase it like a joke to get him to relent and stop doing it. Um, but, you know, I feel like I do, you know, if it, it came down to it, I most certainly would you know, make sure that it happened. But it's important to be able to have a good line of communication with the people that are close to you and to be able to know how to communicate with them when you need to tell them, listen, w when I let so-and-so out or when, you know, whatever, I really don't want you to pet him too much here. If you could pet him, pet him on the behind or, you know, we're working on X, Y, and Z. So, you know, and, and if you work on these things now, it's going to be 10 times easier down the road. But in some cases it's not, you know, my dog is never going to like a lot of frontal pressure from a man that he doesn't know. Um, especially if that man starts I think from, from touching men him. and women. Yeah. Men and women, strangers. He doesn't like when people come on strong come and, on strong, and I don't blame yep. him because nobody wants a bad Tinder date. That's what I say. I'm like, don't be a Tinder <laughs> date. Don't start crawling all over my dog I don't and I know that I sound so bitchy when I say that and I know my family members not in my house <laughs> but other people that meet they're like oh god Laurie she's so high strung but I'm like back up I need to make this a good thing and Ruben is a good boy and he doesn't like people getting up in his grill right away and you know neither do I so 
I'll respect that about my dog and then tell people stay away. So my thing with Ruben is you were out of the house the other day. I let Ruben up. I told everyone that was over. Don't touch him. Don't touch him. Let him walk around. He's, I mean, Ruben's not so reactive that he would walk around and just start like, you know, biting anyone. Oh, not at all. He just really doesn't right. like it when you pet him too much and he doesn't, and you don't know him. So like, I that's tell literally everyone, the bottom line. <laughs> leave him alone. And then usually Ruben will walk up and he'll invite himself to be pet, but just don't run up to him and start hugging up on him and stuff. And he's great that way. Buddha's a little different. I can say, go ahead and, you know, pet him. But then there was one person that took their hands and like really scrubbed his face. There's a few people and they were all guys. Sorry, guys. Um, and I said, hey, hey, you got to calm down. Like you can't just, you can't really walk up uh, to any dog and just start like putting your hands in their face and like roughing them up and wrestling. I mean, it is a Rottweiler. I know that he's has a great temperament, but you really just shouldn't approach a dog like that. I, I think that people have lost respect for dogs. I agree. I think it's a, it's also societal pressure, you know, that people have to kind of... It's not a baby. Yeah, exactly. Like act all cutesy and talk baby talk and give the dog a lot of attention because what hap- what's happening right now is as millennials put more emphasis on dogs, the friends know like, okay, well, this guy really loves his dog and I really love this guy. So a great way to show this guy that I really love him is if I like shower all this love on his dog. You know what I mean? Imagine. And it's like... And, and it's like, no, man, like it's an animal. You got to take a step back. And I think that it's meant it comes from a good place that people are like, OK, I want to show this person that I love dogs, too. And I really, really do love dogs. And I love my own dog so, so, so much. And I'm going to love this dog just as much because all dogs are created equal. And. All of that stuff is fake. It's not real. It's not really what the dog needs at all. So, you know, if you meet a dog, even if they're your friend's dog, just, you know, giving a little bit of space goes a long way. And I think it doesn't matter if you have the most bulletproof dog, you know, a dog is just not going to love it if somebody comes on too strong in that way, especially if they're a stranger and they don't know who you are. Imagine if it was a baby. And the equivalent to just scruffing up a dog's face, like if you saw a baby and you kind of just like tip him upside down and shook him, like <laughs> you you wouldn't do that. No. And even when I even when I have a class, uh, people will come with their brand new puppy, and the puppy's at the end of the leash straining to keep walking forward. So of course the parents walk forward, which is a pet peeve of mine because every time the dog hits the end of the leash and is headed in any direction, the parent follows them and they don't realize that that is just so many strikes against loose leash walking because the the dog learns that when they hit the end of the leash and they continue, they have to drag their human along and they're like, I have to go to the end of this leash and then I get to pet, I get to be pet by this person and even if I don't want to be pet by them, I get to jump all over them. So... I know that when parents first meet me, they're like, well, they have warnings because usually it's a referral. So yeah. <laughs> people are like, oh, Laurie, she's a little different. And and so I, I'll say, stand, stand where you are. Stop moving. Don't let your puppy drag you all the way over me just so he can give me a crotch hit. Like, I don't even get it. <laughs> they're like, I don't know what to do. He jumps on everyone. I go, stand in one place and hold the leash. You've already eliminated your you're running up to people problem. And then we work on some other exercises. And then when the dog is calm, I'll, I'll show them how I have puppies greet people. And then that's a really nice greeting. I think it's because parents feel rushed and they feel bad and they won't, don't want anyone to think they're mean. Everybody thinks I'm mean, but I'm never rushed. <laughs> I, I want to I want to make it the best situation possible. And when you're training your dog, guys... You should just get lost training them. You should just focus on them and then nothing else matters and you can deal with people interactions or your dog saying hello. Hold that leash, start there, and then work on your dog just chilling with you. It it doesn't need, it will not be a less social dog if you don't let your dog molest every single person they meet or if you don't let people 
just crowd your dog all the time. Yeah, totally. And I had a class the other day and one of the things that, you know, we were talking about was the owner I just had a really busy household. So I they had many children and they, you know, have a very busy neighborhood. A lot of kids coming over and you know, company and everything like that. And um, you know, one of the things that the mom was concerned about was just general traffic and, you know, having people over for like an outdoor barbecue, you know, and the thing that is really important, a puppy doesn't need to be stimulated for an extended period of time. So if you bring the puppy out for 10 minutes, that's enough, 10 minutes in a bathroom break, and then the puppy can rest in their crate and decompress from that, right? So that was just like a load of material that the puppy's going to get from strangers and who knows, maybe another dog um, because, you know, there's it's just a really busy in home environment. Um, it's not necessary for the puppy to be out the entire time. Take your time with the puppy and then, you know, let the puppy rest in the crate and entertain your guests. Have a good time. Talk drink wine, do everything that you normally do. And, you know, you're working the puppy and training in by taking shorter segments and still you're enjoying yourself, which is the whole point of having company over. The whole point of having company over is not so the company can meet your dog. It's so that you can, you know, have something to do and and enjoy the company of people. So that would also be another thing that I would like to add. And um, in general, you know, just again, keeping clear lines of communication open with those people that are close to you so that you can advocate for your dog. And we talked a lot about puppies and with a rescue dog or an older dog being introduced into the family, you know, it might even need even more management because you may not, you know, the the dog might not be as reliable, which is totally fine. Once again, taking the dog out for short segments to desensitize um, or socialize and then being okay with allowing them to rest in the crate so that you can enjoy yourself and, uh, you know, so that you can get that quality over quantity of time out of the crate is really, really important. Um, So yeah, with friends and family, it is okay to communicate with them and you are going to get a lot of different advice, guys. Everybody thinks that they are a dog trainer because they have had dogs in the past and I wish I could pull it up on my phone, but my friend Tyler posted the greatest um, little, you know, um, meme. meme. It was a meme, but it was pretty, it was long. It was too long to be a meme. I don't know. But it was it was Radical. perfect because it just talked about, you know, you know, every person has a toilet, but not everybody's a plumber. You know, everybody can plug in their light lamp, but not everybody's electrician. And, you know, maybe everybody can change their oil, but not everybody is a mechanic. And really, guys, the same thing is true with dog handling, right? So I mean, we talked about it on the car today, Laurie. How many how many dogs do you think that you've handled over the years? If you had to guess. I really have no idea. I, I was literally, literally going to count all my evaluation forms just so I could get a more accurate number. But see, now you're talking about, what did you just say? Cause you're like advocating for everyone because then I was thinking of trainers when you mentioned that. And then I thought if you're working with one trainer, you should really stick with one trainer mm. and trust them. Because everyone's offering, oh, because you said everyone offers you advice. Yep. And I always say, well, they don't know exactly your dog. Your dog might be different. They yeah, didn't 100%. Have to, they didn't have to implement the same training techniques that you did. You, you really have to stay the course, guys. And Yeah, you're going to get advice from And don't from have all... too many trainers. And yeah, don't Google yep. everything. Like, we've already done it. Like, and it's, and it's real life experience. So, you yeah, know, that hear, is... hear your trainer out. Totally. And there's loads of good ones and there's loads of not good ones too. But, you know, I'm here for you guys. And again, I really love networking. So even if you live somewhere that we don't service, I can certainly try to find somebody good um, for you that can fit whatever it is that you need. But you're going to get information from different different people, right? They're going to tell you, well, you know, just do this or just do that. If you just, if you just, which is cool. But at the same time, it might not be the right advice because dog training is super counterintuitive if you have never done it before. (laughs) And it's 90%. It's just the way that you live and abide with your dog. Just the expectations that you have of them normally on an everyday basis. And some of that stuff can't, it's difficult to teach. And sometimes you really do have to have somebody that knows because they've seen, you know, a lot of different situations to come in and give a little bit of guidance. So we try to be there for our clients as much as we possibly can. But if you meet a trainer and for some reason you don't like them 
or you're not vibing with them, or I feel like I'm not, I'll send you to another trainer that I think will really work out for you. hundred percent. It's, it's, it, you know, like you could say, no, this is absolutely not what I'm going to do. I've had some people ask me questions and I'm like, well, we're definitely not a good match. Yeah. And we've had people. Um, and I send them to someone yeah, else. Yeah. That go somewhere else. And, the and pers- that's fine. And the other person might say something very, very similar to the advice that we were giving, but they're able to deliver it in a way that can communicate with that person better. Awesome. Yeah. And they follow through more with that. I mean, it bums me out that I don't get along with every single person, but after all this time, I mean, it's, it's bound to happen. We're not a, I might not be the trainer lid for every dog parent pod. No, and my, <laughs> I know that I am not um, as well. And it's just the way that it is. You know, you're going to vibe with some people and not with others. And that's totally cool. You should feel comfortable. Comfortable with your dog. Comfortable with how people touch your dog. I mean, in the beginning, I, I, when I, I'm like, if I do anything that bothers you, if I do anything with your dog that bothers you, you let me know. You let me know in the moment. And then you can leave if you want. But please tell me. I'm a heavy communicator. So if something's going wrong, you tell me. So be comfortable wherever you go. And then if you, if we had more sessions of this, it would be like advocating at the vet, advocating in public, like you said. If you're oh, yeah. On this the is going to go so. on and on. It's, a, it's an important topic because, again, it encompasses that piece of dog training that just happens that's not formal. And it's something that is super important. So um, again, thank you for tuning in. I really very much appreciate it. This was part one of our Advocating for Your Dog series, Advocating for Your Dog with Friends and Family. Once again, thank you guys so much for listening. I know that our time is very divided and there are a lot of options and we absolutely love your support and we love that you love dogs as much as we do and hopefully love people as much as we do too because that's an important part of what we do. But um, again, thank you for your support on Patreon and for following us on social media platforms. If you could please, please, please share and review this podcast if you are into it. I hope you have a wonderful week and we will see you next time. Thank you.